oder nicht, ähm, dass ich den schreiben äh, musste. Und äh, bevor ich das äh, sage, wollte ich aber... Ah, doch, jetzt kommen die jetzt. So we just are at the question and answer period now, so it's perfect that you... Um, um, und ich wollte nur eben sagen, dass um, ich fühle mich auch ein bisschen als ein Interloper, weil ich um, zu Rosenzweig sehr wenig geschrieben habe, eigentlich fast nichts, aber mit Rosenzweig aufgewachsen bin. Und zwar seit, neun, seit, seit der Stern auf, in der Niemeyer-Ausgabe erschienen ist, habe ich ihn äh, damals auch sogar 1980 rezensiert. Vielleicht nennt man das eine Chutzpe. Das macht ja aber Spaß. Und er ist, äh, darf, also ich habe ihn vor Hegel und vor Kant und anderen gelesen. Und ich bin, das ist für mich also quasi ein Element des Denkens geworden, wo ich immer wieder überrascht bin, wenn ich das lese, äh, wie wichtig das ist. Und ähm, darum bin ich auch zurückhaltend, wenn ich wissenschaftlich zu Rosenzweig arbeite, weil er für mich ein, ein Teil meines Instrumentariums ist. Und das ist nur, das, die, dann kommt der zweite Vorfrage, was ist ein Kommentar? Und das muss man ganz kurz, wollte ich das doch nochmals auch in Rede bringen, denn ein Kommentar ist, äh, ist, wird oft als eine spezifisch jüdische Literaturgattung bestimmt, was es nicht unbedingt sein muss, aber es gibt eine ganz wichtige Tradition innerhalb des jüdischen Denkens, das sich nur über Kommentare ausspricht. Und ähm, wie ich dann zeigen werde, ist auch der Stern der Erlösung selber eine Art von Kommentar, oder ich möchte ihn jedenfalls gerne auch so lesen, was nicht ganz überraschend ist nach dem, was wir bereits gehört haben. Ähm, die dritte Vorbemerkung ist die mit der Frage der Beginner, des, des Beginnens, des ähm, Beginnens und der Beginner und des Anfangs oder des Anfängers, was ja auch ein philosophischer Topos ist, der zurückgeht zum Anfang der Philosophie. Und äh, wir wissen, Kant, Spinoza, Hegel haben all dieses Problem. Hegel hat äh, 500 Seiten geschrieben, man nennt das die Phänomenologie des Geistes und man weiß nicht, wo fängt, hört die Einleitung auf und wo fängt der Text an und ähm, das sind Überlegungen, die, äh, die ich denke, die doch sehr wichtig sind und jetzt nur ein paar, äh, eine Minute, was ich auf Deutsch, was ich auf Englisch vortragen werde, ähm, es, es ist ganz klar natürlich, dass der Stern der Erlösung voller Zitate, Resonanzen und Stilelemente von Goethe ist, ähm, was mich aber interessiert und was ich versuche zu zeigen, ist, dass äh, auch philosophisch relevante Momente sind, die durch diese Zitate, Resonanzen und Stilelemente und Gattungselemente spielen. Und der Schlusspointe wird sein, dass eben der Stern der Erlösung auch ein Kommentar, ein jüdischer Kommentar zu Faust ist, zu Goethe ist und dass damit eben andererseits auch Goethe gelesen werden sollte oder müsste mit dem Stern der Lösung oder mit Rosenzweig und damit eben doch eine ganz interessante Konstellation deutsch-jüdischen Denkens geschaffen worden ist, die ich denke, die genau in, auch inhaltlich formal durch die Performance irgendwie gewisse Dinge einlöst, die inhaltlich auch durchdacht werden. Aber ich möchte Ihnen das jetzt äh, im, im Durchgang kurz skizzieren, ähm, wie das funktioniert. Und ähm, also ich, wenn ich das nenne Güte kontra Hegel, dann meine ich das auch als Kontrapunkt. Ein Kontrapunkt, der eben durch den ganzen Stern durchschwingt, aber nicht als Gegenteil, sondern eben als Kontrapunkt, der eben wirklich im Dialog, in diesem Mehrstimmigkeit mitstimmt, wo Goethe eben ein Teil dieses Projekts werden kann. Wie es auch sehr schön äh, Gabriela gezeigt hat in dieser Stelle, dieser schönen Lektüre, wie eben diese Art von Gebet doch eben auch ein, oder ein Teil von diesem größeren Projekt ist. Und das ist auch eine, das also ähm, quasi das deutsch-jüdische Projekt der Moderne bei Rosenzweig nicht sich darin versteht, wie es missverstanden wird, als Assimilation oder An Akkulturation, sondern den Teil Goethe zum Beispiel als integralen Teil eines größeren Ganzes zu verstehen, 
größeres Ganzes wäre natürlich auch ein goethischer Term, äh, in dem eben das Deutsche und das, was immer das ist, und das Heidnische und das Christliche und das Spinozistische und das Rosenzweigische Jahne sich auf, aufeinander eingehen und aufeinander eingehen müssen, um weiterzukommen. Okay, also jetzt äh, gehe ich aufs Englische und versuche das schmerzlos, äh, in, ich, ich versuche nicht zu schnell zu lesen, ähm, es wird ungefähr 40 Minuten sein, nicht garantiert nicht länger, es kann auch schneller sein, wenn es sein muss. Ähm, It has often been noted that quotes, resonances and the style of, of Goethe permeat, if not inform, Rosenzweig's writing, viewed as fashionable mannerism of the tradition of bourgeois culture that liberal Judaism, liberal German Judaism liked to embrace, the adoption of Goethe had come to play an important role in 19th century Jewish cultural life. Serving cultural as well as sociological and political functions, Goethe reception had become a central fixture in the 19th and early 20th century culture war, and not just with regard to the positioning of liberal German Jewry. Cultural capital with gold standard value, Goethe had however not remained uncontested, and the value of his stocks has seen nervous fluctuation reacting to changing markets. Participating in the Goethe cult meant many things to many people. Many motives, interests, concerns and agendas drove the cult, but foremost it had become the domain of the liberal bourgeoisie. Gustav Landauer observed that Goethe reception was mainly a Jewish affair. And indeed, without the salons of Jewish women such as Rachel van Hagen and the beginning of Goethe industry in the late 19th century, spearheaded by Jewish scholars such as Ludwig Geiger, Emil Ludwig and a whole crowd of Jewish philologists, Goethe reception is hard to imagine. While Goethe had, become, had come to become for many national conservative Germans politically unreliable, and it's important to understand that in the 19th century Goethe has a very bad rap in Germany, his cosmopolitan and forward-looking vision of culture and Bildung promised the emancipatory development German Jews had so eagerly been looking forward to. While Goethe had become suspect to conservatives, Liberals embraced Goethe as the exponent of a moderate modernity. In embracing culturally liberal position, Goethe stood for the combination of the best German culture would represent. But make no mistake, Goethe remained exposed as a contested figure and siding with him meant anything but easy assimilation. And again, that's, I think, an important point. To side with Goethe did not mean an easy way of assimilization at that point. Rather, I would argue adopting Goethe could also mean to reimagine the project of German culture in creative manner. Goethe didn't stand for a well-defined political or cultural position, but rather one that remained open to renegotiation and reinvention. That was the appeal and allure that made Goethe so attractive. For the generations from Georg Simmel to Franz Rosenzweig, Goethe served as the figure that offered the possibility to imagine German culture as open, cosmopolitan, and progressive without forsaking the rich inner life that industrialized mass culture threatened to destroy. But Goethe represented many more aspects, and some of the central ones figure in Rosenzweig's The Star of Redemption in illuminating ways. If I, could, if I would like to argue that in order to understand the star, we need to attend to the paramount role Goethe plays with regard to content, structure, and use of language and diction, we need first to understand the different aspects or parts that constitute the role of Goethe in Rosenzweig's argument. These different parts will allow us to better assess the critical role that Goethe plays in the star. The presence of Goethe is marked in Rosenzweig through numerous quotes that ran through the textual weave in sometimes obvious and sometimes rather subliminal manner. It modulates the style in a particular manner. While the motive of Faust is the most obvious one, Rosenzweig quotes from and refers often to other texts that constitute what we can call the Goethe tone or Goethe effect. This effect, I would argue, shapes and defines the star as a whole as a literary work and serves as a distinct feature. If we take Rosenzweig's Sprachdenken or speech thinking seriously, we cannot help but notice a critical purpose of the presence of Goethe in the star, 
a presence that drives the role of Goethe in what otherwise would seem a mere mannerism, and often it seems a mere mannerism. In speech thinking, however, the performative role of the resonances and references to Goethe play a profoundly critical role. But let us first distinguish the different parts of the role that Goethe plays in Rosenzweig. On the one hand, Goethe represents the paradigm of the pagan and Spinozist, interestingly interrupted at one point when Rosenzweig points to the double nature of Goethe as both paradigmatically pagan and Christian, and both at the same time, mutually constitutive. And that's also quite interesting, and I'll come back to that. On the other hand, Goethe makes a key appearance at the central passage of the star, Rosenzweig's interpretation of the Songs of Songs. But as Goethe's citations ran throughout and informed the text as a whole, Goethe plays a particular role with larger implications. Goethe serves in the star as counterpoint to launch a philosophy that cuts itself free from the Hegelian legacies that haunt the philosophical discourse as we know it. If Hegel and his legacy is the open opponent from which Rosenzweig seeks emancipation. The challenge is how to break free from the powerful hold that Hegel continues to exert. If philosophy as we know it has become problematic and in many ways obsolete for Rosenzweig, the challenge is how to imagine and originate an alternative discourse. In this context, the function of Goethe serves as a programmatic purpose that allows Rosenzweig to ground his writing in a distinctly non-Hegelian language and mode of thought and, and project a new way of developing his line of argument. Rather than mere cultural capital, capital, Goethe functions in Rosenzweig as the medium through which those concerns are given voice that philosophy had ignored, if not muted. And if we examine a few of the joints and turning points in the text, we can see just how decisive a role the recourse to Goethe plays for the construction of the star's argument. As the star opens in philosophers, in opposition and against the philosophers, Rosenzweig pointedly reaches for Goethe's Faust, thus making Faust's drama of knowledge the pivot of his argument. Reaching for the vial with the lethal brown drink that harbors death only to put it back onto the shelf, Faust escapes the temptation of suicide and returns to life with a renewed sense of rebirth in the star. Two pages into the introduction, the star refers to this scene of Faust as the inaugural scene of the drama of knowledge. Addressing knowledge as the drama of human existence situates the process of knowledge in a context that is wider and more encompassing than the discipline of philosophy that instead is staged as part of a larger process of cognition. The star's introduction returns to the figure of Faust as it concludes with a striking illusion at the end of the introduction that is rich and suggestive and deserves our attention. And I read it quickly. Das Nichts unseres Wissen ist kein einfaches Nichts, sondern ein dreifaches... I forgot, by the way, to welcome you all to the beginning. Das Nichts unseres Wissens ist kein einfaches, sondern ein dreifaches. Damit enthält es sich in die Verheißung der Bestimmbarkeit. Und deshalb dürfen wir so gut wie Faust hoffen, in diesem Nichts, diesem dreifachen Nichts des Wissens, das All, das wir zerstückeln mussten, wiederzufinden. Und dann, quote, and quote, versinke denn, ich könnte auch sagen, steige. Just as Faust embarks on his journey to the regions of the mothers, entering a world where the difference between sinking and ascending fades away. Rosenzweig has knowledge faced the threefold nothing from which knowledge originates as already preformed. Just like the nether regions of the spheres of the mothers, the threefold nothing is shapeless and amorphous but pregnant with presuppositions unlike the tabula rasa from which philosophy claims to spring. And so the only narrative he has to do that would be false. If at the beginning of knowledge stands Faust's encounter with death and the amorphous shapelessness of the mothers, the star's second part, and so what, is it, what I'm trying to show is that the, these juncture points where Faust plays a role. The second uh, part opens with reference to a line moments after Faust overcomes the temptation of death, returning the glass with the lethal juice to the self of study. And I quote now, the other very nice presentation we heard about Das Wunder ist das Glaubens liebstes Kind. And, we, and I think that's one of the first instances 
uh, where Gerard, where we already get an interesting comment on the secularization theory, because I think it, it's a theme that runs also through the star, um, and it's the, the, with that quote he actually produced. We seem to return to the face, but we actually get a theory of secularization here. But and, and now I play this through a little bit, this passage. But faith seems to have abound, abandoned its parental obligations and handed over the miracle to theology. The nurse that in terms has thought, have you heard about the nurse here? So it's a little bit ambivalent about nurses. In turn has sought over the course of the 19th century to get rid of its charge. So he has this genealogy of the, the father and the, the child, the wunder. However, Rosenzweig points out the theological maid is forced to respect the father, that is faith and cannot therefore read itself from its charge. Yet, as Rosenzweig now quotes Goethe again, and that's from a different passage, kommt, kommt Zeit, kommt Rat, comes time, comes counsel. Um, and with a Goethean flower, he continues now, der Alte kann nicht ewig leben. Grammatically, Rosenzweig refers to the faith, the father of the miracle, but the locution, der Alte, playfully refers to the prologue of Faust, where Mephistopheles puts himself on equal footing with the Lord, summing up the result of his dialogue with the Lord. And the passage there, which automatically gets into your ear, is, von Zeit zu Zeit sehe ich den Alten gern und hüte mich mit ihm zu brechen. Es ist, so that's what Mephisto says, es ist gar hübsch von einem großen Herrn so menschlich mit dem Teufel selbst zu sprechen. So, if faith dies, its child will be doomed as well. The rest is history, the history of the Enlightenment, that is. But there is another connotation. Rosenzweig talk, Rosenzweig's talk of the old and frail father who cannot go on forever suggests. Invoking Mephistopheles' concluding short monologue just quoted, the passage also suggests that there is more at stake than just faith. The Alte kann nicht ewig leben expresses an anxiety about the existence of God that only the miracle could resolve, with the, while theology is more than a questionable caretaker or nurse. Rosenzweig uses the word Pflegerin of the faith in God. Maybe even faith in God is the miracle of which theology would be afraid, as its potential own undoing. After all, part of two has its, as its epigraph in theolo Theologos. So that's all like mounted on this one quote from Faust. Rosenzweig, however, is neither interested in replacing philosophy by theology nor theology by philosophy. Rather, he explores the space in between that constitutes both theology and theology, philosophy and theology. And I quote, Sie sind aufeinander angewiesen und erzeugen so miteinander einen neuen, zwischen Theologie und Philosophie gestellten, sei es nun Philosophen oder Theologentyp. While the juxtaposition between Hegel and Goethe can be exemplified by the distinction between the absolute and the Urphänomen, a term, however, as we already discussed, that doesn't appear in the star. My argument is that via the reflection and contrast to Goethe in point distinction to the absence of any reference to the Hegelian discourse where, if you remember in the phenomenology of the mind, the communal aspects of the spirit and its mutual recognition plays, as we know, a crucial and profound role. So you could have redemption through the communal in Hegel. But that's where he tries to sort of like bifurcate it and go on the Goethean track. But Rosenzweig would not have any of that, of course, of the Hegelian. And in using Goethe as his reference, sets him himself apart from the discourse and apparatus of philosophy by playing against the apparatus of theology. Of course, siding with Goethe doesn't imply embracing Goethe entirely. But more interestingly, it also opens up the question of Goethe's own multiple aspects. And I think that's now where it becomes interesting as a creative reading of Goethe. This way, the star can indeed be read as a commentary on Goethe, and we could dare to say that Rosenzweig's, Rosenzweig articulates Jewish thought, among other things, also in terms of a commentary to Goethe. Goethe thus assumes richer and more suggestive contours, I would argue, the star even suggests we could conclude that the more Jewish philosophy becomes, the more profoundly it is capable to understanding the richness of Goethe, the paramount German, the Germans could only grasp partially. 
Put in the terms of Rosenzweig's notion of the Jewish and Christian truths, truths of Goethe as the truths at the interface between paganism and Christianity comes now only to the fore in its full force when read in and with the Jewish context. So you can read Goethe as a Christian and as a pagan because you can read him with a, with a Jewish context. Let's return to the sentence from which I had quoted, and that's my conclusion, earlier and quoted in full along with the one that follows it. The passage is part of the introduction to part three that sets up the final part of the book with its discussion of a phenomenological interpretation of Judaism and Christianity. Goethe is here cast as the paradigmatic exemplification of the point of indifference between the two, I quote. Goethe ist wirklich in einem zugleich der große Heide und der große Christ. Er ist das eine, in dem er das andere ist. And because he is both at the same time, but with profound family resemblance to Jewish tradition, as Rosenzweig's discussion of the Song of Songs suggests, Goethe's Faust can, unlike Hegel, serve as a guideline for the star's line of argumentation. So in fact, it can actually work. We can then read Goethe's uh, Faust's career as the steady succession from love object to love object until he matures to become ready for redemption. From, from the attempts at conjuring the spirits of the earth and the Easter Sunday walk in nature when Faust's experience brings awakening to, uh, to the tragedy of Gretchen and so on, Faust grows until he finally is ready for redemption. The development reflects the progression from the god of the mystics he seeks to approach through the invocation of spirits as the in sich lebendige Gottes mythos, five lines, until Faust reaches the deeper understanding at the very end that when finally the Offenbare Gott der Liebe replaces the God of the Mystics, which is precisely the trick Faust goes through too. But while Faust, and that's not my conclusion, reiterates the vision that me, man redeems God who in turn will redeem man, Rosenzweig inverts, as you know, the order God first redeems man who in turn redeems God. In this play of commentary as creative adoption with a difference, Rosenzweig succeeds in both giving philosophy a new form and Goethe a richer and deeper understanding. But it is the constitutive nexus that presents the special feature of his intervention and solicits as, as such our critical attention. Thank you.